Travel and things in association with Rugged Wear, Real People, Real Clothing, Real Solutions presents In Conversation With. And they say that winter is coming, if you remember Game of Thrones. Well, winter is already here. But the new range of rugged wear jackets for both men and women, uh, these high quality winter jackets are already available from uh, rugged wear, either online or at their store in Nelspreet. So why don't uh, you purchase one and keep yourself warm this winter? And talking of keeping myself or keeping yourself warm, you can also while you're sitting at the fire, buy yourself a copy of the Guider's Guide to Guiding. This is the third edition. It's printed by, or it's published by Jakana, which means that my guest today is none other than the author of that book, Garth Thompson. Garth, how are you doing? Morning, David. Exceptionally well, thank you. Great. It's great to finally meet you. We've spoken you sent me letters about incidents that have happened to you, but this is the first time that you and I are actually seeing each other or meeting each other virtually. Yeah, well, thank you for tracking me down. <laughs> they, uh, Fogaza said to me that if I could find you, I can get points for my tracking um, assessment when I do it in a couple of weeks' time. So I think... I think I've scored. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done. Well, uh, finding someone in the middle of Zimbabwe is not that easy in the, the, the current world that we live in. Garth, firstly, how, we now know that you're in Zim. You've just mentioned it. Um, how long have you been in the guiding industry? Uh, 41 years. I've uh, been a guide for 41 years, but... I suppose I can't really count last year because I only had uh, two or three safaris uh, due to the COVID outbreak. But uh, yeah, 41 years in total, probably 40 years guiding. So what gave you the idea to do the guide's guide to guiding? Uh, a number of things. So firstly, uh, I think I wrote it just after guiding. I wanted to uh, give something to the guides, <clears throat> a shortcut to the learning process so that they didn't have to uh, break all the rules and make all the mistakes I did in my first, uh, let's hope it was only the first 10 or 15 years. Um, and I suppose being human, none of us are perfect and we carry on to carry on doing those things, but it's certainly, hopefully we do a lot less of them. So it was um, mainly to share with them some of the many mistakes I'd made in my guiding career. And also I had been on safari all over Africa with a number of um, uh, other guides as a, uh, with me in, in the role as a private guide. And I had seen some of the um, shortcomings in our industry. And uh, I decided to compile a book to share with uh, the public, but mainly aimed at guides, uh, so that um, that was really how to treat the customer, how to treat the guest. Now, and without uh, safari guests, we have no livelihood. Now, speaking of that, the illustrations for your book, and let me nail my colors <laughs> to the mast right now, are done by my father-in-law, the inimitable uh, cartoonist Dorf Fedler. And this picture has always spoken to me from when I, when I got edition one of this book. This is the way guides used to be perceived. I don't think that many guides are seen this way anymore. You know, fighting crocodiles and beating off lions with their, <laughs> with their fists. Uh, uh, I I have to admit, David, I haven't come across any like that for 20 years. <laughs> um, but in the first 20 years of my guiding, yeah, there was uh, maybe 50-50 were like that. <laughs> <laughs> I've only just noticed after all these years of looking at these cartoons that there's a David, tiny mouse. Guiding 40 years ago. <laughs> well, yeah, guiding 40 years ago was... Um, the Wild West, and especially, let's say, in Zimbabwe, we only had independence uh, 40, 
one years ago. And so Zimbabwe had been at war for 18 years or 15 years, and uh, we'd never really met any international people. So um, meeting international guests was uh, quite a, um, a new story for us. And, uh, but this type of guide I have encountered, not only in Zimbabwe, but South Africa and Botswana, and uh, so, yeah, I uh, think that your father-in-law, Dorf Fedler, did a phenomenal job in depicting what uh, I read out to him. So when uh, we compiled the book, I went and sat with him for three hours, which turned into three days. <laughs> and I only had the budget for about 40 odd cartoons, but we ended up doing 96. And I have to say it's three of um, the most memorable, some of the most memorable days of my life watching that pencil scribble away and all of a sudden on the sheet of paper came alive with the most poignant depiction of the um, sector that I'd read, read out on the book where I wanted to place that cartoon. And I, this was such a great uh, cartoon of his for the first edition. This was the cover of the book. And as I mentioned to you um, before this, um, I changed the cover because in the bookstores, it actually looked like a cartoon book. The cartoon was so excellent. <laughs> you, you talk about this being where guiding used to be. Um, do you believe that, that guiding has, has come forward in leaps and bounds, Garth, and that people now see it as a, as a career path rather than just a couple of years to spend between finishing school and going to get a in inverted commas, real job. Yeah, David, good question. I can't tell you how this industry has changed. Um, as you said, 20, 30 years ago, a lot of guides did it for two or three years, then went and got a real job. But there have been many guides um, like myself, black and white, that have uh, made this a complete career and educated our children and bought a house and bought a car or two and sent our kids to university. And this has become our profession. And that's why um, many countries we're known as professional guides, um, because that is, uh, is what we do for uh, a livelihood. And um, I think uh, it's so encouraging to see how many guides that have taken this path um, as a complete career. Just as a matter of interest, in the book, um, which I, we said earlier is now in its third edition. And it says here how to join the tourist industry, qualifications and requirements, uh, who and where to learn from, etc. Are there chapters that were in the first edition, which you've sort of re-looked at and have said, well, maybe those are no longer valid? Or by the same token, are there chapters that you've added because new, new areas have cropped in, uh, for instance, digital photography rather than film photography? Hmm. Okay, very good, David. Yeah, that is one that I updated. Um, I, um, I have uh, updated the book a couple of times. And when I was reading through it this morning, just before uh, opening up to chat to you, I did see uh, a word <clears throat> that I use quite a bit in there, that uh, I now must uh, um, make a note of changing for another edition. And it's a, a four letter word that uh, I detest. Um, it's been used so much in our industry for decades, um, maybe for a century, but um, that's the word, the four letter word game referring to these beautiful, majestic, fantastic animals uh, in a belittling <clears throat> name like game. Well, game is uh, tiddlywink, soccer, football, netball, those are games. Um, uh, game comes from the connotation of uh, these animals are game to shoot. Uh, they're game to kill. And, and uh, I don't think in our industry where we're taking guests for non-consumptive purposes to appreciate and educate them on these beautiful specimens out there of mammals and birds and fish and reptiles um, that uh, the word game is appropriate anymore, David. It's, uh, it's something that I try a lot to um, revise with the words wildlife or animal. Um, and uh, so it's something I must put into the next revised edition. Another thing that I inserted into the last edition, which you have there, 
is um, after my elephant massage <clears throat> a number of years ago, <laughs> I put in a, another section on breaking the rules. Um, so those are the main updates that I have done uh, on the book on photography and that little edition, um, All right. as well as topping up a few other things here and there, but they were the main, you, main you, uh, for the revised version. You've alluded to the, inc the elephant massage. Um, I know what the incident was. You very well know what the incident was because you were there. But I should imagine many of my viewers do not know what happened. So would you enlighten us with your fireside tale of what happened to you that day outside the hide um, in Botswana? Okay, listen, uh, I, I, this is my first time on Zoom, as you know, and I believe we only have 40 minutes. <laughs> the story Don't can be... Go, about 30 minutes long, so I'll try and give you the keep it, the keep it brief, but, um, but Garth, just remember that I am warned. Um, uh -huh. Zoom will warn me about the time, and if necessary, I will make the adjustments on my side. Don't worry about it. Um, just tell us your story, yeah. but keep it, keep it brief. Let's put it that way. So, I was on safari alone um, in Botswana. I was at Savuti camp. It was the end of a, um, a very successful season. And I was inspecting some of the wilderness safaris camps. And I was at Savuti Lodge. And there was a log pile hide, a hide that you sit inside, and uh, very big uh, logs that protect you from elephant uh, coming and touching you in any manner as long as you stay inside the hide. So the afternoon I arrived there, it was teeming with elephants and it was an incredible experience to sit in, inside the hide, having them drinking water meters away and smelling them and listening to them screaming and rumbling and growling. And um, the next morning, as happens in most places, um, there was no elephant in sight. They only tend to come down at uh, 10 or 11 o'clock to drink. Uh, I went into the hide at sunrise. I'm sure the staff left me there because thinking and knowing that I should be a responsible <laughs> guide anyway, I uh, was sitting there with my camera poking it through some of the logs and impala and zebra and wildebeest were coming down and I'm talking about the water only being 10 or 15 meters away. So because uh, I had to poke my camera through some of these logs and sit uh, in a crouched or hunched position. I thought, well, I'll just take my uh, director's chair, the canvas one, and place it outside the hide and wedge it in between the logs in the outside corner, right-hand corner of the hide. Well, I sat there and all went well. I took some magnificent photographs of zebra and wildebeest coming drinking meters from me without even knowing I was there because my um, background was uh, covered up, my silhouette was covered up by the logs behind me and at about, I was going to leave there at 10.30 because I had to catch a flight to uh, another camp and at about 10 past 10 the flow of animals stopped coming down and I thought well maybe I should go up to my room now and pack my bags and get ready to go and then I must argument with myself now you said you're going to be here till 10.30 so stay till 10.30 and I was reading one of Derek and Beverly Jabeur's um, books while I was sitting there. And the uh, next minute, the so a shadow fell on me and I looked to my right and uh, two or three meters from me, uh, two or three bull elephants ran down um, to slake their thirst. And bear in mind, this was October uh, in Botswana. Oh, wow, this is fantastic. And I've always... Uh, Loved elephant is my main passion, and, and um, so I was photographing these bulls from just meters away, and then uh, all of a sudden, some calves came running past. This is uh, now time to change my position because uh, things have changed with the the female elephant coming down, being very protective with their calves. So. I thought, well, I'll just wait for them to move a little bit around the water hole and then I'll climb back into the protection of the log pile. The sky got a lot darker and I looked up to my right and there was this um, big female elephant, long tusks. And uh, you know, when you are in a 
a pub or a situation and you know you're going to get a slap from somebody just by the look in their eyes and I could see that this cow uh, was not a great lover of humans so um, I pointed my camera at her because I didn't really want to have eye contact and um, she then uh, came forward with her head lifted me onto the leadwood log pile hide and um, pushed me over the corner so bear in mind I was in the on the outside right hand corner and then I fell into the dirt on the other side and she came and pushed me a few meters then she stood back and she came and did a, another charge and I took my hat off and threw it at her and that pushed her back again and then I heard a, a bang I watched this missile flying through the sky and it was a bear banger that Colin Bell who uh, was the head of wilderness at the had made it um, compulsory for all management and guides to carry bear bangers and um, one of the management uh, uh, guy called Pat who I bumped into two, two weeks ago he fired his bear banger and I watched this uh, missile flying across the sky with a smoke trail behind it it exploded um, and here these breeding herds were down drinking and they all stampeded off and I felt such a fool lying there in piles of elephant dung that had been trodden into the ground. And um, I realized there was something wrong with my leg and my femur had been dislocated. And um, my camera lay broken and I lay broken. And I felt, a, like I said, a complete fool for having disturbed this whole situation where they come for hours of walking to come and, and slake their thirst. And then another missile went off from another guide up there called Benson and that cleared out the entire elephant herd and they came down once everybody was gone or all the elephant had gone and put me onto one of those um, emergency stretchers and to cut a long story short called the cutter which came within an hour and off to mound and put into a, um, an ambulance jet uh, off to Lanseria and Lanseria to Park Hospital and as I was being wheelchaired into intensive care or to have my operation, uh, I remember there was Colin Bell standing, shaking my book at me. <laughs> and uh, so I said to him, yes, I am guilty as charged. And, uh, but the <clears throat> good thing about it is I didn't have any guests with me. And those are the kind of things that, you break the rules um, yeah. when you don't have guests. Hopefully you don't break the rules when you do have them because that's exactly what can ha happen. And uh, the three um, most important things as far as being a guide is concerned and that I put on the back of the book is safety, safety and safety yeah. as far as your guest lives are concerned. So people don't pay a lot of money and fly halfway around the world to come on safari with somebody who's licensed and um, a professional and end up um, with an arm missing or a leg missing or paralyzed or flying back in a body box. So safety is the most important thing when guiding your, uh, your guests, not nothing to do with knowledge or showing uh, great uh, wildlife um, settings. It's really keeping them safe throughout the, um, the safari that they're on. So yes, that was a good lesson that I learned. And obviously I've um, taken a lot of uh, flack and abuse for it but um <laughs> it's i broke the rules and that's yeah. uh, the little bit that i put in there uh about that and hopefully other guides don't have to go through the same painful process i did now using another one of dorb's illustrations um i i do believe having gone on many safaris that the, the guides once again have changed not everything is just information 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 it's become immersive for the guests because with the advent of the internet, guests can do their own homework about how many kills a lion makes or the length of a giraffe's tongue or, you know, do impala sleep in the trees type of thing. Um, and they can spend more time watching rather than listening to somebody spouting off information they've learned out of a manual. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, David. There's um, so many guys like to imprint on their guests how knowledgeable they are, which is fine. 
if you have the guests for a few days or a few weeks, um, spread out your knowledge slowly over time. But um, the analogy I put in the book is uh, only in my early 40s did we ever um, have the means to go skiing. And, you know, we'd heard about skiing and how fantastic it is and, uh, from everybody over the years. And off we went and um, we had a, a wonderful skiing trip and wonderful ski instructor. However, our main purpose of skiing was snow. I was um, not to learn about the village, not to learn how old the church was, <laughs> um, not to learn about how snow, uh, snow is made or what kind of pine trees were growing there. Uh, we went to ski and um, people that want to come to Africa, it's all about mammals and birds um, and the, the beautiful trees and terrain that we have in Africa. And uh, that's the reason people come out here and people come back uh, time and time again as African junkies. And um, they don't want to have a whole lot of information thrown at them within the first one or two hours. And uh, I picked so many people up at airstrips and taken them along. And within the first 10 minutes, your first Impala comes bounding next to the car. <clears throat> and um, I've always marveled at how many <laughs> rounds of uh, photographic uh, frames they fire on the Impala and <clears throat> although they're going to see far better in Impala, I don't want to tell them to stop their fun, you see, yeah, <clears throat> because uh, that's what they do. It's their holiday. It's not my holiday. Yeah. And you're there to make sure that they have maximum enjoyment on their holiday, maximum safety, and um, you there as the presenter. And so let them um, fire away uh, 200 photographs on an Impala because these days with digital, it um, doesn't cost us anything. No. And as long as they're having fun, um, let them do that. But uh, to start to, after the airstrip, to go and stop at a tree and explain the whole ecology of the area you're going into. And meanwhile, all they're rearing to do is to get on the slopes and get skiing. Yeah. And um, so later on in the trip, you can then tell all these pearls of wisdom that you have to give. Well, like this particular, in this particular instance, where again, another one of Dorb's illustrations, they're all the animals stand, you know, sometimes I think game drives are specifically for the animals are like a Gary Larson far side cartoon. The animals are all hiding, and they're going, let's see if the people can spot us. And if they do, then we'll pose nicely. And if they just drive past mm -hmm. us because the guy well, behind the steering wheel wants to tell yeah. stories, then they can just go on their merry way and we'll do what we do without getting, yeah. without there being an interaction. Yeah, so again, I go to many different camps throughout the year and uh, try to work as closely as possible with the guides and tell them before we've gone out, um, uh, that listen this is uh, day five or day 15 or day 21 of the safari and we've seen been fortunate to see so much of this that and the other yet uh, you aren't um, two kilometers out and you start getting a whole <clears throat> lecture on the the trees and the soils and uh, a spider in the on the side of the road meanwhile your guests uh, trigger fingers are itching to take a photograph and they've been hearing a lot of this stuff and so I think it's one of the most important things for guiding is to being able to <clears throat> read your guests and know, find out from them before you leave while you're having coffee in the morning. Where have you been? What have you seen? Uh, what were your highlights? What are your interests? And so a lot of guides, I think, uh, like to give off uh, all this knowledge to imprint on their guests. And then mm -hmm. when they get back and in front of their peers and management, uh, the guests say, oh, <clears throat> Jason is so knowledgeable. We learn so much from him. And uh, us guys sit and preen ourselves and uh, smile away and, and beat our chests uh, secretly behind the scenes. But uh, then if you said, so what did you see? And then they say, oh, well, you know, we saw an interesting spider and we learned so much about the life of trees and plants, um, but they didn't ski, David. So um, <laughs> these people might have taken 10 photographs and they didn't come on a safari to hear a guy's voice turning on all the time about his incredible knowledge. So they just have to know when it's appropriate to feed out this information. Yeah. Because I, I also believe that often you realize very quickly what the guide's favorite 
animals, birds, plants, trees are because the 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 sometimes those those drives. I was about to say game drives. Those animal drives because you said we can't use the word game. Um, the, the drives that you go on, the safari, the safari that you go on, um, is is in a way skewed towards what the guide wants to see more than what you want to see. Or they'll stop for a very brief time because the radio says that 14 kilometers away, there is a pride of lions moving north, south, east or west. And he figures that stopping at an elephant sighting or even an impala sighting is less interesting than trying to drive 14 kilometers at a Ferrari speed in the hope of getting to the pride before they lie down under a tree for the entire day, you know, and watching lions sleeping is not the most interesting mm. of activities. Mm. Lying around. Exactly. Yeah, that's where, uh, you know, the guides, if there's a great sighting that's a long distance away and they realize it could make the day, it could make the entire safari, they have to advise the guests, listen, this is the option. Um, it could be a 15, 20 minute drive. Um, I'm going to drive faster than I normally would like to, um, but I'd like to try and get you to the sighting if possible. Hopefully it'll still be there. There's a chance it might not be there. Um, or we can just carry on enjoying birds and whatever mammals we come across. And uh, of course the guests are gonna say nine times out of 10, yeah, that they'd like to go and see the exceptional sighting. Well, and that, um, what is the case? And uh, then just hold on, and the guy drive faster than normal, and hopefully get there safely. And uh, the sighting is still there. So we've all had uh, those situations, and many of them have been very beneficial. And if you do get there and you've missed out, well, at least uh, you see that the guy has tried his hardest to try and get you the uh, presentation. Garth, can I toss a left of field question at you? I promised you I wasn't an investigative journalist. Um, but this is a little little out of maybe your comfort area. Tell me about Garth Thompson in Matric. What were you like? Did you know in your final year at school that this is what you were going to do with the rest of your life? Um, not Matric, Dov. Uh, when I was three or four when people asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. My father had exposed me a lot to um, the outdoor life and he used to go and uh, hunt problem animals on various farms in the country, which happened in the early 60s. And I went along not on the hunts, but to stay with the, the staff at the hunting camp. And so um, that's where I was exposed to this. And then like all, like many young boys in Z Zimbabwe or Rhodesia as it was at the time and South Africa, many of us wanted to become game rangers. Um, however, at the age of about 12 or 13, a lot of them decided, well, they'd like um, other vocations in life. Um, my vocation never, ever wavered. It's something I wanted to do my um, entire teenage years. And then I went to the army for three years and again was exposed to three years of sleeping out in the open and going into some very wild areas and uh, yeah, sleeping under the stars nearly every night. And then uh, when I finished my three years in the army, I was very fortunate to get offered a job um, at Wangi Safari Lodge. And that was in February, 1979. And uh, that's where I started my career in wildlife. And um, it's been, uh, yeah. Uh, the, rest the greatest career I could have ever wished for. I've met some fantastic people, seen incredible things. I always like to say my vocation is vacation <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I often do five weeks safaris with guests on holiday. And uh, so I go to many amazing places all over Africa. And um, so, yeah, my life has been like one long holiday. <laughs> Obviously, there's a lot of stresses that come into it. Uh, ensuring that uh, your guests are happy and safe throughout a trip. And yeah. Um, yeah, so like you said earlier on, people say, when are you going to get a real job? And um, real job uh, has been my vocation as uh, been a vacation. That's fabulous. Goth, 
our time is almost up. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. The book is called The Guide's Guide to Guiding. It's published by Jakana. This is the third edition. It is available. If you can find a first edition with uh, this cartoon on the front, I suggest you buy that and keep it uh, because it might one day well be a collector's item. Once again, Garth, thank you very much for joining me here on In Conversation With. Thank you, David. Thank you for your support. My guest today has been Garth Thompson. Remember, Travel and Things is in association with Rugged Wear, bringing you in conversation with Rugged Wear, real people, real clothing, real solutions. Once again, uh, Garth, thank you so much uh, for being my guest. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you.